I tried to gear this to be as generally accessible as possible. I made the slides purposefully very information rich so that if something goes by, you can use them as a resource, but please interrupt me at any point with any questions. Um, today I'll be talking about this uh, neologism, which is uh, in situ omics, uh, which are general methods for profiling tissue spatial organization. Um, very briefly, I think it's important to define your terminology. So omics is very popular in the broad. Um, these are high content, preferably unbiased characterizations of a collection of biological molecules. We know these very well. We've done genomics for many years. We're now doing transcriptomics and proteomics all the time. And we're doing metatabolomics uh, in many groups throughout the institute. I think we have a platform at the broad for every one of these four modalities. What we're adding on now is the in situ aspect, which means without destroying the sample and retaining the spatial information. So this requires really rethinking how you do almost every part of these measurements. And I'll tell you, this has been a very active area of research over the last six to seven years, and I'll tell you about some of the major highlights throughout. I'll show you a few of the relevant papers, and now the biological results that are just starting to come out uh, over the last couple of years. But overall, why would you even want to do something like this? One is that we think about tissues a lot from dissociated measurements. So single cell sequencing has become a transformative technique uh, in almost every field of biology. Uh, but we tend to ignore the fact that there are compositional biases to those measurements. So some cells are less well receptive to uh, being dissociated and measured by single cell sequencing. Uh, if you do the measurements in situ, the idea is you're less biased and you can get a better sense for how the tissue actually looks. By retaining uh, spatial information, you can also look at cell-to-cell -cell interactions based on proximity and making uh, computational um, inferences from the data. Of course, you can also look at spatial variation of biomolecules across tissues. You can look for concentration gradients of morphogens or anything like that over a developing sample. And for me personally, the most exciting thing you can do is you can start to combine many of these assays into um, the same measurement to look at multimodal pictures of the same tissue. Uh, you can look at how morphology and transcriptomics are linked uh, in the same cells. So, I'll go over this timeline. I'll spend almost all of the time talking about the in situ omics methods that are available right now. I see I didn't get rid of every snarky thing for YouTube, uh, but I'll talk about some of the methodological techno tech dev opportunities that are still remaining. Very briefly talk about the untapped biological areas, and then for you, possibly more interesting, which method might be right for your particular system and how you might go about making that decision. And then finally, the capabilities that uh, we're building up both at the Broad and specifically at the platform I direct on um, spatial methodologies. So, the, you're familiar with a lot of in situ measurements for just one species. Uh, we've had, if you were talking about genomics, the analog would be DNA fish you can make a fluorescent uh, oligomer which can hybridize to a sequence of DNA that you've designed. And you can do this in situ without taking the genome out of the cell and get a sense for where a particular sequence is within that cell. Very similar, uh, you can do the same thing for mRNA and get a sense for how many copies of a particular mRNA you have inside of a cell. And you can do this depending on how many fluorescence channels, you can do maybe two, three, or four um, species at the same time or different regions of the genome. Similarly, we've had immunofluorescence for many decades at this point, uh, which allows you to detect uh, the concentration of a protein using an antibody and then convert that signal into fluorescence with a fluorescently tagged secondary antibody. And then finally, I wasn't sure what to put in for the chemical sensors, so I took something that I did in my undergrad uh, obviously, this is not a representative section, but uh, you can look at um, chemical modalities uh, here, uh, copper one, 
uh, which we're detecting with a fluorescent sensor, but you can imagine many such molecules developed for a variety of different biomolecules. And really, I'm just trying to uh, kiss up a little bit to the therapeutics crowd here. I made this. <laughs> uh, but the question is now, how do we increase the bandwidth from one to many? Um, one of the ideas is to overcome the spectral crowding uh, fluorophores by doing sequential rounds of imaging. Another is to assign spatial information somehow to a barcode that you can then read out together in the data acquisition stage. And then the third common modality is to uh, leverage mass spectrometry, which uh, has a much larger detector bandwidth since you can detect a variety of different elements, a variety of different mass to um, weight ratios. Uh, and having the four different modalities versus these three uh, different ways to multiplex things has resulted in an awful matrix, which we will go through for the rest of the, this talk, uh, which I'm going to call methodological menagerie. So here you have the, model, the thing you're trying to detect in a high flex fashion versus the various different modalities to look at it. I'm going to point out one particular separation, which is over here. Uh, cyclic fluorescence, I think, has become the most popular of these methods at this point. Uh, and I'm going to subdivide that based on hybridization-based techniques, which rely on sequential rounds of fish, if you will. Uh, Sequencing-based techniques, uh, which do in-situ sequencing, leveraging something like sequencing by synthesis, uh, sequencing by ligation, or just uh, commercial alumina chemistry. Uh, and then there are methods for, that directly detect uh, the, the signals without going through a DNA uh, oligo intermediate. I'll talk about only, <laughs> only these five boxes today. Uh, if you want to know about any of the rest of them, we can talk offline or afterwards in the questions. Um, but these are the most uh, popular methods so far and the most, uh, mostly widely used. And we'll just get right into it, starting with uh, the hybridization-based technologies for in-situ transcriptomics. Now, I mentioned RNA fish, which is the basis for all of these methods, but we'll do it again one more time so everybody's on the same page. The idea is you have a collection of different RNA molecules inside of a cell. Uh, here, different transcript types are represented by different colored thick gray lines. And you can come in with uh, complementary probes and detect these. Uh, you can do one gene per color channel, so up to four or five uh, genes per experiment. Now, this has been done for many years. People have gotten very good at it. And the same idea, but with brighter signals, is commercially available. You can buy it from RNA scope, uh, from, or from ACD Bio in the form of RNA scope. You can buy in situ HCR probes from molecular technologies, and then progressively better and better amplified signals, uh, including most recently Saberfish from Pungin's lab. But what if you want to do more? Uh, the easiest thing you can imagine is just doing this a bunch of times. So um, you can take those same probes and strip them off your sample uh, using something like formamide or high heat or a variety of different methods, and then restain with another set of probes and do another round of imaging against a different set of um, mRNAs. And you can do this as many times as your sample and either you or your postdoc will tolerate, which usually means less than 50. Uh, but it works very well, and it's been done many times. Um, most recently, uh, in this uh, paper from the Linerson lab, I want to say, um, which I'll highlight now to, get us, to give you a sense for what this kind of data can generate. So they actually did a very interesting thing. They published, uh, this is the entire paper. These are both figures in it. Uh, they did 37, uh, or I'm sorry, 15 rounds of imaging for 37 genes um, across this portion of the mammalian somatosensory cortex. Uh, this is a mouse section. And they chose canonical genes which are known to define particular cell types. Uh, when they were able to identify, as far as we know, every single cell, and they found very good correspondence between their spatially defined cell types and the cell types that they knew existed there by single cell RNA sequencing. 
So what this gives you, which is new, is that now you know where these cell types are actually positioned inside uh, this piece of tissue, and you can use this to perform uh, computational clustering to define anatomical regions, and potentially to infer cell-to-cell -cell, uh, connectivity. Uh, I mean, connectivity here does not mean axon to dendrite, it means some sort of chemical proximity-based uh, interaction. So for example, you can think about what type of astrocyte is closest to what type of um, excitatory or inhibitory neuron. And this is sort of the default experiment. Every single uh, in-situ RNA method has done a version of this, usually in basically the same tissue. And in fact, there is now a comparison project going on to figure out which of these tools does the best in terms of classifying different cell types uh, within this exact system. But what if you want to go to more than 30 or 50 genes? Uh, your opportunity here is to go to a combinatorial detection-based approach. So here you have to take a slightly different uh, avenue. Rather than directly detecting the mRNAs, you go through an encoding probe. These are these little angular oligos that I've drawn on here. So each one of these corresponds to a particular mRNA species and is assigned a barcode that you will be able to read out later. The reason you do this is that it's been found that this increase or drastically decreases the amount of time you have to spend hybridizing and rehybridizing. So that instead of doing, you know, overnight exposure, um, overnight destains, you're doing 20 minute stains and destains and restains. So the idea is now you come in with a fluorescent uh, oligo against your secondary or your, against your encoding probe, you, uh, strip it off and restain and perform this a smaller number of times than you would have to do with linear encoding single molecule fish. I'm gonna pause here in case none of that made any sense and see if anybody's brave enough to ask a question. Yeah? Yeah, I think you're about to get a uh, mic thrown in your face, but uh, the question was, uh, did I say that the cycling time was about uh, 25 minutes? And yes, that's what I'm saying. Uh, it's, this stain is much faster than staining directly onto the mRNA. I, I actually don't know why, but it's been shown by many labs that this is the case. It's, the assumption is that this is something about the crowding of the mRNA. Uh, and the, re, uh, the restain is five minutes, so. Okay, so there's been two versions of this protocol that are basically identical to this. You've probably heard of one or two of them at least. Uh, they're called Murfish and Seekfish. Uh, Murfish is from Xiao Wei Zhuang's lab at Harvard. Uh, the first paper was in 2015 in science. Seekfish is from Long Kai's lab, uh, who's now at UPenn, uh, which was started up in 2014. And they've gone through about five iterations each, and they've kept the nomenclature consistent. So. When you think about Murfish or Seekfish, you really should think about what year of Murfish or Seekfish you're talking about. Uh, the only real difference between the two protocols is the degree of error checking. So I'll show you what I mean here. Um, this is the figure from the first Seekfish paper, and it gives you a better sense of how the method works as well. Uh, here you have mRNAs that are detected in every round with a particular color, and the number of mRNAs you can detect is the number of um, barcodes uh, to the number of cycles you have available. I think. So the basic idea is that with uh, five barcodes and three cycles of imaging, you can do 125 genes. The difference from, uh, between this and Murfish is that in Murfish, they assign a much larger codebook space. So they're not, uh, they're using many more rounds of hybridization and staining, but they're much more robust to errors in hybridization, spot calling, or stripping than the original Seekfish protocol. Now, both protocols have borrowed from each other over the years, so Seekfish now has a degree of error correction in it. Murfish has borrowed some of the amplification strategies that Seekfish used in order to get bright signals. Um, and then I actually made you guys a movie so you can see it, uh, what the data actually looks like. This is one cell from Murfish, 
which is uh, going through 16 rounds of um, imaging, and there is one particular dot which is uh, lighting up in only four out of the 16 rounds. So you can assign that to a particular um, gene identity. There, the key point to think about though is that you need single molecule resolution to perform this imaging barcoding. If you zoom out so you can't resolve single molecules, none of this will work. You can't call the bases. And I want to point out a very common misconception that uh, very intense lasers are required. That's not true anymore. That was true in the original Murfish paper, which uh, used photobleaching as the way to remove the floor floor. Now that they've switched to chemical means, they go both much faster. And if your laser is a little uh, more dim, you just take a little bit longer to take your images. Uh, of course, brighter light is always helpful because it takes less time to do the imaging. Um, so now that these tools have been around for a while, they actually both have um, real neuroscience studies that have come out with them. Uh, on the Murphy side, um, they performed a similar cell type clustering uh, to what uh, was done with OSM fish, also called awesome fish, um, which is to perform 130 plex um, profiling of the preoptic region of the hypothalamus. And one of the things they found is that we typically draw, the, or by we, I guess I mean the Allen Institute, typically draws the anatomical definitions of the nuclei of this region uh, based on subtle variations of neuron density. But it turns out that if you map the cell type clustering onto this same space, they don't really match up at all. And so one of the key outputs of this uh, study, in addition to a very nice comparison between the performance of Murfish and single cell RNA sequencing, was a more refined understanding of the anatomical structure of this region of the hypothalamus. Um, similarly, um, Seekfish has um, really pushed the boat out in terms of how many different transcripts uh, they've been able to detect. Uh, the latest paper last year was able to detect basically the full transcriptome doing 10,000 genes. Uh, they did this in several different tissues. Here I'm showing uh, the same example they highlight in the olfactory bulb, where based on the increase, uh, the statistically, uh, significant increase in the proximity of two different cell types next to each other and their knowledge of the full transcriptome of the cell, they can back out or at least propose uh, receptor ligand interactions that may be mediating these kinds of interactions, which is a very cool uh, thing that I don't know how you would do with single cell RNA sequencing. So those are the uh, hybridization-based methods. On the other hand, the there's several methods that just take a different approach to the readout, and they, I'm gonna highlight them as a separate category. They're assaying the same kind of information, but they're better suited, and people have started applying them as more in distinct ways from the hybridization-based approaches. The first approach uh, came out of Matt Nilsson's lab in 2013, and I'm gonna step you through this flowchart, but basically, you have an mRNA, you put on a random hexamer primer, and you use reverse transcriptase to get a cDNA. You can then come in with what's called a padlock probe, which is a piece of DNA which can hybridize to two regions on the cDNA. And you can make these in two different versions, either a gap filling or a barcoding padlock. The gap filling padlock has a little space over here, which you can then fill up with a polymerase and a ligase while the barcode padlock doesn't have that. It just has a nick which you can seal with a ligase. Regardless of what you do, there is a site here that you can use to initiate rolling circle amplification and get many, many copies of this uh, small locked padlock. These then typically carry a short barcode which can be read out by in situ sequencing, either Illumina, solid, or a variety of chemistries that have come out since then. And uh, this is it in action. This is the darkest picture I've ever seen in a paper, but the point is this is a cell, and there are five bases in here, which uh, you can see over several cycles can be assigned to um, a sequence 
the same way that you would with Illumina chemistry. So I'm gonna briefly highlight four derivatives of this technique. There's uh, the original in situ sequencing and the protocol um, all the way through. There was a follow-up the year later from George, uh, this year is wrong, that should be 2015, um, from George Church's lab, which instead of using padlocks, tried to circularize the entire mRNA, um, cDNA, uh, allowing you to read out the full sequence. Now that's been very difficult. Uh, a lot of people haven't been able to follow it up, but uh, in the first paper, it looked very nice. Uh, there's been a subsequent follow-up uh, from the first author of that paper, uh, who now has his own lab, I think at Cold Spring Harbor, um, which uh, appears to be doing a little bit better by having um, more sophisticated sequencing chemistry. Um, and then uh, finally, our own Xiao Wang in her uh, postdoc project developed a derivative of this, sort of a hybrid between uh, in situ sequencing and hybridization based approaches which uses uh, hybridization of a padlock and the primer simultaneously on the mRNA to avoid the initial reverse transcriptase step. Uh, this is very important because a, a reverse transcriptase is the lowest uh, efficiency step in the whole process, and she's able to capture uh, much more uh, lowly expressed genes this way. Uh, the rest of the techniques really work best for higher expressors. And she's also developed her own um, Se uh, in situ sequencing chemistry, which is more uh, robust. So I'll now highlight a couple of different approaches where this is particularly uh, appealing. So, uh, this is for the gap filling approach. Um, Tony Zader's lab at Coldstream Harbor has been developing Synbis viruses, which are uh, express various uh, barcodes, which can be injected uh, wherever you like in the mammalian brain, and then will traffic out to the axonal projections. What they've used in, sequence, in situ sequencing for is to figure out which cells are expressing which barcode, while then taking out chunks of brain that they think might contain these axonal projections and putting it through single cell sequencing. I think the reason that they do that is that um, it's much easier to do imaging when you know where you should be imaging. <laughs> Uh, but regardless, this uh, approach works well. They're able to uh, see the individual cells' barcodes and link them up to projection maps, allowing them to generate these kind of connectomics uh, data sets where you can classify the cells you've infected on the basis of their projection patterns to different brain regions. A similar tool for a very different application came out of Paul Blaney's lab last year. Um, where they realized that uh, this gap filling approach could be used to sequence uh, guide RNA, which can be introduced into uh, any cell system that is transfectable. So they borrowed the CropSeq vector, um, which was published as part of a perturbSeq approach, which uh, puts the guide RNA sequence into an mRNA. Uh, and they're able to sequence these directly. I think this will play. This is from their paper. Um, but these are hex cells, each expressing uh, a single copy of a guide RNA, uh, which you can then use to uh, figure out what genomic perturbation you applied to this cell type. Now, the reason you want to do something like that is because it allows you to perform pooled optical screening. What that means is that uh, this is just sequencing, but you can also think about parameters such as morphology, protein tracking, calcium imaging, uh, in their case, Uh, in their case, they looked at NF-kappa-B translocation to the nucleus to look for regulators of, um, which are implicated in the trafficking of this protein. And they were able to, much as you see with most CRISPR studies, they were able to pick out almost every known element of the pathway in a single screen, uh, notably this time uh, requiring much less um, resources because uh, doing a 40 million cell screen is just a single six well plate which can be done with the right automation, which we'll get to uh, down the line. It can be done in um, a couple of days uh, without doing any kind of library extraction or anything like that. 
And then finally, um, this just came out. Uh, I thought it was interesting. Um, this is from Matt Nielsen's lab again, so the originator of the technique. Um, and it's using a ligase, which uh, only ligates if you have complete complementarity to a region of interest, rather than, um, and not ligating if you have a mismatch. So what they were trying to do here is to figure out the degree of RNA editing that they, um, the different genes in the brain experience over the course of development. Um, they chose a few different uh, mutations and a few different genes that they were interested in. And of course they found differences, or I guess it wouldn't have been published, uh, showing that in the adult you have much higher uh, editing levels in a particular set of genes, while other genes tend to not be affected. Um, this brings us close to the end. I want to point out a couple of technical takeaways that I think I mentioned along the way. Uh, first, fish-based methods are intrinsically more sensitive than the in-situ sequencing methods. Uh, that's just because there's no RT step. Um, they generally allow you to sparsify your signal, which uh, basically means that some transcripts can be dark uh, in some or many rounds, which allows you to get higher numbers of genes profiled and higher numbers of transcripts. Um, but the signals with fish-based approaches still tend to be quite a bit dimmer because you don't have the rolling circle amplification step. And the low detection efficiency of in-situ sequencing can sort of perversely be an advantage when you're looking at something that's extremely highly expressing, which would just crowd out your combinatorial fish completely. Um, and of course, uh, in situ sequencing, when properly configured, uh, allows you to read out uh, the native RNA sequence, which can be potentially useful. This is a good stopping point before we move on to the next step. Okay. So, um, there's another branch of tools which uh, tries to assign a barcode to a particular RNA species based on its spatial information. It's really the answer to what if I really hate to use microscopes? Um, you don't have to. <laughs> uh, these approaches in general tend to be uh, do uh, many more genes and they can be untargeted. There's actually some commercial products out right now. Uh, 10X recently bought uh, a company called Spatial Transcriptomics out of Sweden and renamed it Visium and made the protocol a little more accessible. Uh, that's something that you can just buy now. But uh, one of the downsides is that these methods overall still tend to have quite a bit lower capture efficiencies. You're looking at um, transcript detection levels that are more similar to single cell RNA sequencing rather than to fish. So that can be an order of magnitude or more in, uh, in terms of dropout. I'll only highlight one approach uh, out of these, uh, partially because they're extensively published uh, and partially because the idea is very similar. Uh, and that's the SlideSeq approach that was developed in uh, Fei Chen and Evan McCosco's lab uh, at the Stanley Center. The basic idea is that you can take um, effectively drop seek beads and deposit them on a cover slip or a slide uh, in this kind of uh, circular array, which you can then perform in situ sequencing with, with any of the tools that we discussed in the previous section. So that, can, that doesn't have to be done by the user, that can be done by anybody, and these slides can then be shipped to uh, an end user who simply has to cut their tissue and uh, smack it down directly onto the cover slip, um, which captures the RNA, performs an RT and tissue digestion step, and allows you to amplify a library which now contains the spatial barcodes associated with every single bead. Um, they've done beautiful work demonstrating that um, these kinds of approaches can be used in brain, in cerebellum, uh, factory bulb, kidney, liver, and the number of tissues is growing almost weekly. Um, the, Interesting thing, of course, is that you're getting full transcriptome data for free, so you can perform the traditional single cell uh, RNA sequencing clustering analyses and then map those clusters back to the spatially uh, mapped or to the spatial locations given by the drop seek uh, bead identities. 
Uh, so this here, they've found that the top, uh, or I guess we're calling this dorsal since we're real neuroscientists, the dorsal edge of the hippocampus uh, is identified as a single cluster in the single cell RNA sequencing data. They're not uh, color coding this based on any kind of spatial information. They're just mere, merely mapping this cluster back into the original data space. Uh, and the same uh, stands true for the Habenela here. And because this is an unbiased approach, uh, you can do interesting things. Uh, the example they chose in their paper is to reveal the transcriptomic response to a traumatic brain injury. So they take a mouse brain and they stab it with a needle and they sh can look for a variety of different uh, programs which are upregulated over the course of this injury healing. Okay, we're about to leave RNA space go into protein space. <laughs> okay, so this is going to be similar uh, in feel, but a uh, very different kind of data. So if you wanna look at proteomics, you have a bunch of different proteins that are hanging out in your cell, and the approach that all of the multiplexed uh, protein uh, Omic, proteomics tools have taken is to detect them with a variety of antibodies specific against each particular um, species, which are then tagged in a variety of different ways. So the first thing we'll go over is the mass tagged approaches that use the large sensor bandwidth of mass spectrometry by tagging every individual antibody with a particular heavy metal isotope. Since there's hopefully no heavy metals in your biological sample, these are very cleanly isolated from the native biological signal using mass spectrometry. The idea is that you take a sample, you stain it with your library of antibodies, and you can raster the sample with either a UV laser or an O2 uh, plasma gun. That's the difference basically between secondary ion mass spectrometry or uh, laser desorption mass spectrometry. Uh, and then one way or another, you ionize the sample down to its constituent atoms and you detect it using a time of flight mass spectrometer. Then you can take the resulting spectrum and separate it out according to uh, mass bins to give you the picture of every individual antibody's labeling. And then of course, they go through uh, data processing and cell segmentation pipeline in order to give you the multiplexed expression data for every cell. Now, this has proven to be uh, pretty powerful in cancer immuno immunology, where people typically have questions about cell type identification, which can't be answered with just four or five different markers. The example paper uh, that I've chosen here from 2018 uh, looked at triple negative breast cancer and stained, I think, about 46 different markers simultaneously. Um, and then, looked at the variety of different uh, samples they had and found some interesting things. For example, they were able to cluster the different uh, types of patient samples into uh, samples which had more mixed populations between immune cells and tumor cells and samples which had stronger compartmentalization between the tumor and the immune environments. The important thing to point out is that if you were to do the same kind of analysis by uh, single cell sequencing, you would uh, end up getting the same number of, the same ratio of cells for both of these sample types, even though the spatial localization is very different. And this allows you to do things like map out uh, important immune markers, important ch uh, checkpoint markers uh, along the tumor uh, immune boundary. And at the end of the day, it allows you to find morphological features which are predictive of the survival of a particular cancer patient. So in this particular study, it turned out that patients with this compartmentalized phenotype actually survived a lot longer uh, and responded better to therapy than patients uh, which had this more mixed phenotype. So this is a, a real predictive tool. And then um, if we now take the same approach and go over into fluorescent space, the idea is very similar, except that now the antibodies are not tagged with uh, metals, they are tagged with uh, oligos the same way that we did the original uh, fish work. 
you can then come in with complementary algos, uh, stain, image, destain, re-image, and perform this as many times as you want for the number of antibodies you have. Now, the typical numbers here are lower than with uh, RNA. You can't uh, do combinatorial imaging because there's just too much protein in a cell to get single molecule resolution, although it would be very exciting to figure a way out uh, around that limitation. And um, this has started to be used. Um, you know, it, the same technology has like three different names at this point. Uh, here I'm showing PRISM, uh, which uh, Jeff Cottrell had a hand in developing, uh, which looks at, uh, what is that, 15 different mar uh, synaptic markers simultaneously in cultured neurons, and um, allows you to uh, see how the intensity of each of these markers changes in response to stimulations of these cells. They did a uh, two-day treatment with TTX to see how activity profiling affected the expression of various different synaptic markers. And I think, uh, as we may expect, knowing that these cells are homeostatic, uh, they increased their uh, levels of excitatory synaptic markers. Another approach, switching back into the cancer domain, or into the immunology domain, is that you can track cell-to-cell -cell interactions. Um, this is work done in spleen, uh, where a 40-plex panel, 36 or 40, something like that, um, was used to map out all of these cell types uh, within the mouse spleen um, to find cell-to-cell -cell interaction rates uh, based on physical proximity of these cell types. Uh, this is just another way of showing that same idea, that you can look at a cell's nearest neighbors and figure out the most likely cell type next to every particular cell. Um, and perhaps most interestingly, they found that these, um, these interaction maps changed uh, in a mouse model of lupus. Again, even though the overall percentages of the, ch of the cells seem similar, uh, the spatial arrangements between them were different. And so if you're thinking about whether you should use fluorescent or mass tag based approaches, uh, there's a few different considerations. The, one of the key ones is throughput. Uh, fluorescence is, I think, 10,000 times faster uh, than the mass tag based approaches. Uh, the integration time is lower on a pixel by pixel basis and you're acquiring on a camera rather than rastering a laser or an ion beam across your sample. Um, the signal to noise is also higher. Uh, because it can be amplified dramatically, for example, with tools like Immunosaber, which put many copies of an oligo onto a fluorescent, uh, onto an antibody. And it's cheaper, so the hardware cost uh, is much lower because you're not building uh, you know, a ray gun with a mass spec attached to it. Uh, the microscopes, of course, you can spend more money on them, but you don't have to. You can do this with a conventional wide field microscope. The problem, though, is that um, there tends to be autofluorescence background in a lot of fluorescent samples. Uh, this is particularly bad in adult human brain. Uh, it's bad in lung. It's bad in skin. Sometimes you can get around this with amplification. Other times you may not be able to. Um, and there's also uh, an aspect of the wet work that uh, because you're doing iterated staining and destaining, for um, the fluorescence-based approaches, whereas with the mass-based approaches, you're doing one round of uh, wet work. There's a lot more opportunities for things to go wrong uh, with the fluorescence-based approaches until the systems are better stabilized. So if you have high autofluorescence or you are doubtful of your equipment, uh, it's maybe better to do the mass spec-based approaches. Otherwise, the fluorescence ones uh, will win out. So again, this is a good break point. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of things that are left over to do in terms of uh, tech development, and it's at almost every stage of the process. Um, one of the absolutely biggest problems is that um, it's difficult to translate these approaches across different systems. Uh, you're, because you're not taking the sample out of the native context, 
different samples have different levels of autofluorescence, they have different levels of RNase activity, uh, they may require staining or expansion, they may have lower or higher expression levels. So it's proven to be challenging to move out of whatever context the assay was originally developed in. It doesn't mean it's impossible, it just means that you need to plan for a little bit of extra work to adapt it to your particular system of interest. Now fortunately, a lot of the people in this room are neuroscientists and a lot of the method development is actually being done in brain. So it's, if you want to do mouse brain studies, you're probably in a good position. If you want to do, I don't know, human lung, you're in a bad position and you have to do a little bit more work. Um, there's also serious bandwidth limitations that have to be thought about. Um, in situ proteomics still requires antibodies. Um, there are not that many good antibodies, and um, there's even fewer that have been validated in each of these uh, tools. I think the largest panel is still smaller than 100 for the same system, so if you're using a system that requires one of those, great. If you're not, um, you're, you have a job in front of you to validate a whole set of antibodies. Now, the companies are getting better at this. Uh, the panels have doubled in size in the year that I've been working on this. So hopefully that will not be, that'll be exponential and not linear, but um, we'll see. Um, like I mentioned, there's no combinatorial coding approaches for proteins, so that means that even if we do get a thousand different uh, antibodies, we'll be imaging for a really long time. And uh, on the RNA side, the capture-based tools are very powerful, but they're also very expensive. You're doing Illumina sequencing there, so you're paying up front in order to do uh, the assay. If you're getting it from 10x, well, you know what 10x uh, their model is to charge you for upfront and then give you over to Illumina so they can charge you again. Uh, on the other hand, um, imaging tools are very slow when they go to the full transcriptome. Uh, you have to do many rounds of imaging. Uh, I think the lowest is 23 different rounds, and sometimes you have to expand the tissue, which slows down your imaging even more in order to cover the same area. This is, now I'm going to start periodically plugging the work that we do in my lab. Oh, never mind, I'm gonna do that the next slide. <laughs> uh, there's also an overwhelming amount of data that uh, can be generated by these technologies. Uh, both the, this is specifically for the fluorescence-based methods, but right now, uh, the state-of-the-art labs are still using the Orca Flash 4.0 camera. This is gonna get really nerdy, uh, but these cameras generate eight megabits, uh, megabytes of data per exposure, which is about 200 milliseconds. Uh, and they're still not operation, they're not up all the time because most of the labs are in a method development stage. But better cameras are available, they generate fold more data, they can go faster than what we're doing right now, uh, and once you figure out the protocol and are just pushing samples through, the operational uptime can easily be 80% because these, and that's of the hours in a year, not of workday hours. So I expect that we will be able to generate five petabytes a year easily in our lab, which for reference is the total amount of genomic data generated by GP at this point. <laughs> so um, we're working. Hmm? <laughs> uh, I guess marketing, <laughs> I think my backup career plan is marketing for Intel and compressed sensing. <laughs> and then um, in case you didn't think those problems were enough, I think we should have more. Uh, the menagerie can always be bigger. Uh, I'm just highlighting that you know, these fields are pretty densely populated, but the DNA field it's pretty sparse still, and I think there's a lot more to be done here. Now, part of this is because uh, it's a question of biological utility. Most cells have the same genome, so it doesn't make sense to be doing genome sequencing on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. But similar approaches can be used to, for example, look at chromatin structure, um, to look at epigenomic modifications, so I think this will be a rich area of development in the future. And at the same time, uh, the metabolite-based approaches really all rely on spatially resolved mass spec, which is slow, uh, and it would be great if we could figure something out over here. 
Uh, but I confess I've been thinking about this problem for like six years and I still have nothing. So if, if anybody would like to work on this and has an idea, I would like to work on it with you. Um, Finally, uh, there's many different uh, areas that are untapped. Uh, applications outside of neuroscience and cancer immunology are still basically up for grabs. Uh, very few people have migrated to tools over. Um, and of course, we can keep going in, uh, with refining anatomical definitions. Uh, this is already happening as part of the human cell atlas, the human tumor atlas network. Um, as the tools uh, become more and more high throughput in terms of the number of transcripts you can profile, we'll be better able to uh, identify receptor ligand interactions. Um, and I'm hoping that we can uh, eventually get to a place where we're uh, having more informative and predictive uh, clinical pathology diagnosis. And um, particularly excited by the possibility of m merging these tools together to generate multimodal pictures of the same cell. So um, this is going to be an awful flow chart, but uh, you can have the slides later and then walk yourself through it if, as you want. Um, and this is updated as of last night at uh, 1130. Uh, the question you have to ask yourself right now is what kind of information are you looking for? If you want uh, proteins, you want antibody-based uh, readouts. If you want RNA, obviously you want transcriptomic-based readouts. Um, the only uh, real exception, if you say both right now, is uh, a technology called Nanostring DSP. And if you're interested in that, uh, you can talk to either me or to the Regev lab who have this technology in-house. Uh, on the protein side, you, the question is, uh, how many antibodies are you really looking to profile? If it's less than three, then you already know the answer. If it's less than seven, there's a variety of commercial methods uh, which will help you out, Opal or Ultiview. If your tool is highly autofluorescent, you probably want uh, either an ion path MIBI, which we have, or a fluidime imaging mass cytometer, which we don't have, but they're basically the same in terms of data quality. Or you want to start thinking about sequential immunofluorescence, um, which really starts to get to questions like, do you need fast staining? If you know, you can use Sisif, which gives gorgeous signals. If you, do you need fast imaging? If no, you can use a commercial product called the Maxima, although it's very expensive, so maybe you don't want to. Uh, if you need bright signal, if you don't need bright signals, you can use Codex, which we have. And if you absolutely uh, have said yes to everything so far, it looks like the answer is Immunosaper, but it's not commercial. <laughs> um, we'll get to a solution to this uh, situation. And again, here are the commercially available ones. On the RNA side, the first thing to ask yourself is, are you ready to do imaging? If the answer is no, then SlideSeq, spatial transcriptomics, or nanostring are the way to go. These uh, have trade-offs between high counts and high resolution. It's actually a conserved amount of data. It's just how, you're, how finely you're segmenting it, as far as I can tell. Uh, somebody from Faye and Evans' lab can correct me if I got that wrong. Um, if you're willing to image, then again, the question is how many different genes do you want to do? Uh, for less than five, standard uh, fish is totally fine. There is a commercial technology from ADC Bio, which is RNA scope Hyplex, which is basically three rounds of RNA fish, um, but it's commercial and those probes work really well. If you want to do less than 50, you can entertain the idea of using awesome fish. And if you need more than that, you have to do one of these combinatorial methods. Um, which really just depends. Are you doing less than 1,000 genes? You can go for something like FISSEQ or InstaSeq. Uh, and if you're doing low copy number genes, you want to go for a murfish based approach or at least a hybridization-based approach. If you're doing high, cop uh, high copy number genes, you can get away with one of the in-situ sequencing-based approaches. And again, these are the commercially available products right now. And for the rest of them, okay, we have 30 minutes. This is a great break point as well, but if not, I will tell you about what we're doing in order to make these tools more broadly available. Okay, so the problem is that all of these things require sophisticated hardware, one way or another, and usually that's not something you want to be dealing with every day, uh, day in and day out. So I lead a little group called the Optical Profiling Platform which is a team of imaging experts, engineers, and methods developers 
who are trying to bridge the gap between experimental biologists and clinicians and computational biologists in order to get at these kinds of more sophisticated imaging uh, data moieties. Our goal is to implement uh, the latest and greatest in terms of imaging technologies, working either with the inventing company or the inventing lab. Uh, we try to upscale them, especially if they're coming from an academic lab. We want to make the protocols more robust. And of course, on our end, we're trying to develop the next generation of tools. And we're trying to leverage our ability to combine all of these tools in one place. Um, if you want to work with us, the general idea is that if there's something totally new, we'll work together as a collaborator. We'll figure out, first, is this something that we can work together on? We'll work together on the sample prep. And then we'll have imaging facilities available that uh, we can use and evaluate how well this protocol is performing. If this is something a little bit better established, um, and I'll show you some of the things that are at this point, uh, it may be better that a user would prep a sample, hand it off to us, and then we handle the imaging and the low-level data analysis and deliver to uh, the original scientist. Uh, we haven't established every step of this pipeline so far, but we're getting there on some of the techniques. And then behind the scenes, uh, this is all enabled by an automation engineer, an optics expert, computational people, and method developers all working together uh, on a variety of these different uh, approaches. I'll show you where we are, and if you want more, you can read the Stanley Center annual report. <laughs> um, <laughs> these, these are the tools in green. These are the ones that we are actively working on. In bold, somebody at the Broad has worked on this at some point and I can help point you to them. And then finally, the last thing I want to say is that we're extremely close. Our lab space just opened on January 10th. It's a, the Stanley Center is going to be over here. If you remember uh, Tom's presentation from last week, uh, please come by, say hi. If you have an imaging problem, we'd love to talk to you. If you want to use one of these tools, please talk to us. And then here is everybody who you might see uh, roaming around the halls. I'm eternally grateful for all of these people for taking a chance to uh, work for something that is just starting out. I'm also extremely grateful to these people for supporting us as we do this. And we have time for questions. Sammy, the um, MIBI and Codex data that you showed, yeah. were those generated with off-the-shelf antibody panels yes. that anyone can acquire yep. and require relatively little optimization? We did no optimization. <laughs> uh, we should do some. <laughs> uh, you know, it, at least you have to titrate your antibody. We didn't even do that. <laughs> um, and it, most of them worked. <laughs> and the ones that didn't, um, there's a, this is technical details, and you can actually read about this specifically in uh, the paper from Jeff Control and Mark Baffa, but uh, bad samples uh, imaged under codex tend to show a lot of nonspecific staining of the nuclei. This is a well-known problem when you're dealing with fluorescent um, oligos in any way. And so the worse the sample is, the more that staining overwhelms your desired staining. Um, but yeah, it's, it's actually just been working. <laughs> yeah. Can you say anything about computational methods? Uh, is, that, is it pretty well understood how to analyze this data? Are there Absolutely major not. open questions? There are, it's, no, it's not understood at all. I mean, that's, that's not fair. There's, people are working on it is the right answer. But I think, I think there's nobody who works in this field who would say that the problem is solved. It's not solved at almost every level. Base calling which you know, we don't even think about with Illuminix anymore. It's just, we just throw that data away at this point. Um, but we don't know how to base call properly with the varying background levels and the different thicknesses of the tissue and the autofluorescence signals coming in. Um, once you base call, how do you segment? It depends on the tissue, and that's extremely difficult. Extremely low-level problems. How do you align your images? How do you correct for an even illumination? I mean, yeah, there's methods out there, but you need something that works day in, day out on terabytes of data. And the fact is that most data sets that are generated and have taken advantage of the currently available technologies are bespoke. Almost 
everything that's been done that way, you know, you do a bunch of imaging and then you put a grad student or a postdoc on that data for, you know, weeks, months, depending on how long it takes to get to the analyzed product. And they're not directly transferable to what we're doing here. So even once you move past all of these problems and you move past the data flux issue, um, how do you, what more is lurking in the data is uh, still an open question. You know, what we're, the analysis that I've been showing you so far is like cell type A is close to cell type B. There's surely more than that. There's, at the very least, there's morphological information that we're not taking advantage of. But these cells look different from each other. And not every dendritic cell looks the same. We know that they don't look the same, but we're not analyzing that. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's an incredible amount to do. Uh, love to talk to you about it. <laughs> so I just started my first RNA scope um, uh, this week. So I'm a little new at it. But I was wondering okay. if you could explain what um, image-based recordings is? You said it maybe two slides ago. What did I mean? Image-based recording. <laughs> Tell me when it starts this to one. look familiar. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, wrong way. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, Octopatch, yeah. Uh, so I didn't go into that at any length because this was supposed to be about in-situ omics. Um, sorry. No, no, it's totally fine. Um, this I can actually do a chalk talk on, but <laughs> um, the problem with electrophysiology is that while the data it generates is absolutely beautiful, high signal to noise, wonderful, it's very laborious to acquire. So something I worked on in my PhD is an, a way to get the same kind of data while circumventing the need to stick an electrode into the cell. The way we did that is by combining a spectrally orthogonal uh, voltage indicator with a channel rhodopsin actuator. What that means is that we have a sensor that shines red when you are, uh, when the neuron is firing, uh, or at least when the voltage goes up. And we have a channel rhodopsin, which we can hit with blue light, which doesn't affect the sensor. Um, which stimulates activity. And what that allows you to do is do things like fr uh, FI curves. So you can apply increasing intensities of blue light as we're showing, um, as we're showing here. And you can see how uh, the neuron is firing progressively more action potentials as you increase the stimulation. The shape of this curve tells you something about the intrinsic excitability of the neuron. So it's a way to get after electrophysiological information in a much higher throughput way. In principle, you should be able to get to tens of thousands of cells per day this way. These are only four in this field of view, so we have a little bit of work left. And it's not invasive. Right? And it's not invasive. But it's also, um, we're also working in cultured cells, so you have to be honest about that. Working in brain slices is much more difficult. We've done it, but it's difficult. Um, so there, it's, it has strengths and weaknesses, but if you're, especially if we're working in iPS-derived neurons where you're not putting, they are already in culture, it's a very appealing technology. Has anyone made Oh, yeah, we have Optipatch mice. Um, do we, we haven't put it under a CAG promoter. That seems crazy. I almost certainly the mouse wouldn't survive that, I guess. But um, we, not me personally, but a postdoc in Adam's lab did make an Optipatch 2 and Optipatch 3 mouse. And there we have one is in a tiger locus, the other one is in a rosa locus. Uh, yeah, they work. Um, it's not as good as I would love it to be. Um, you need high expression levels in order to get these kinds of voltage uh, signals. The indicator is very dim and you're imaging very fast. Uh, so transgenics generally have lower expression than introducing with an AV. But 
honestly, the place where I'm most excited about it, we, we've done this, I've never talked about this publicly, but um, we did a collaboration when, in my hometown. So basically, I would stop by every Christmas when I was visiting my parents. Um, the lab was interested in the zona granulosa cells of the adrenal cortex, which release aldosterone. And they had found that these cells are electrically active and are just awful to patch. They have a capsid in them. They're mechanically sensitive. You just, if you stick an electrode in them, it's, it's bad. Uh, I think one postdoc patched for four years and got six cells, something like that. Um, but they, uh, they took this transgenic mouse. They crossed it to uh, the relevant promoter. I forgot what they used. And uh, I helped them set up the imaging. You know, one Christmas and then the next Christmas, <laughs> they, uh, they showed a movie which had eight cells recorded simultaneously within one little rosette of the organ. And now I hope it's working for them still. <laughs> I haven't heard back in a while. <laughs> all right, thank you, Sammy. Yeah. Thank you all for having me.